Good morning, guys. If we haven't met yet, I'm Pastor Jeremy. Uh, been at the Upper Cleveland campus for the past six weeks, so it's good to be back down here, man. It's been amazing to watch what God's doing up there. And um, just uh, tell everybody all the time, just pray with one eye open, uh, you know, just in anticipation of what he's going to do. And it has just been great, but it's good to be back here. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, I'm sure that you do. Turn in them to Genesis chapter 50. Genesis chapter 50. I'm going to ask you if you're physically able to stand for the reading of the word that you would. Genesis chapter 50, 19 and 20 are the verses that we are going to be reading. But Joseph replied, do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? As for you, what you intended against me for evil, God intended for good. In order to accomplish a day like this, to preserve the lives of many people. Let's pray. Father, I ask you again, Lord, for the gifts of teaching and preaching. Those are heavenly gifts, Lord, that come from you and you alone. Lord, if uh, what we say today and what we hear today has any eternal value, God, it's going to have to come from you. So I Pray that you will give those gifts, that they'll be received, Lord, and given with all passion and no prejudice, Lord. Lord, that you'll take what you say today, Lord, and that you'll change our lives. God, help us. I ask you to help us to grasp who you are, that you're good and that you're sovereign, that you've got everything under control. I pray that your name is made great today in the name of your son, Jesus. For it's in his name we pray, amen. You can be seated. Hey, we're in the Real God series. Last week was about the goodness of God. Uh, This week's topic is about the sovereignty of God. If you are not in a community group, I encourage you to make sure you get involved in one before this series is over. It is a great way to be able to kind of talk about and flesh out some of the concepts and ideas that we are in attributes of God that we're gonna be learning about over the next few weeks. Um, sovereignty of God. I'm going to give you the, the seminary definition for sovereignty of God to begin with, and then we're going to kind of move from there into the story of Joseph, story from my life, and then, of course, the cross of Jesus. Um, sovereignty of God. This is the textbook seminary definition. God is the supreme ruler of the universe with full rights to govern how he pleases, free from interference by outside sources. Um, to put that in Kaiser terms, which is where I'm from, okay, I'm not making fun of people, Kaiser. to put that in Kaiser terms, God's got it. God is in complete and total control of our lives. And if we look, how much would our lives be different? How much would your life, how, would it, how much would our lives change if we believe that God was really with us in every situation? How much would that affect our outlooks, that in every situation we knew that God was in control and that he was directing everything in our lives, that he was in that divorce that you went through, that he was in that horrible breakup that you thought this person was the one, that he was in that, that time you were passed over for that promotion or whatnot, that, that he was in that. You thought that you deserved it, but but you didn't get it and God was in it. That, you know, God was in even that disability that you were born with or that awful diagnosis that you received from the doctor. God was in the mistreatment that you maybe experienced in your life. God was in that injury that perhaps ended your pursuit of an of a athletic career. That God was in that accident that took the life of a friend or a loved one. That God was in it. How much would our attitudes and outlook on life change if we believed that there was a good God and that he is sovereign in control of everything? How much would our lives change? Genesis, the book of Genesis, teaches us from first chapter to the 50th that God is absolutely in control. He is making everything. He is doing all things, and everything is underneath his plan. He is doing things, and especially in the story of Joseph, The the book of Genesis, one quarter of it is dedicated to the story of this guy, Joseph. And his entire story is all about letting us know that God is sovereignly in control of every little detail of our lives. He's working everything out. So what we're going to do is I opened up with the Genesis 50 passage, which was the end of Joseph's life. But I want us to start at the beginning 
and work our way through his life so that we can perhaps see God's sovereign, good hand guiding his life. And maybe we'll see that in ours. Genesis chapter 37, verse 3. It says this, Now Israel loved Joseph. Israel, also known as Jacob, is Joseph's dad. And he, he says that Joseph loved, or that Jacob loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the son of his old age and he made him a robe of many colors, the famous coat of many colors that you've heard of from the time you were a kid listening to the story of Joseph. Some background of this story, Joseph is the 11th of 12 boys born to Israel. The son, or this man named Israel, he's, again, he's also known as Jacob. He's the founder of the uh, father of the nation of Israel. But Joseph is the 11th and favorite son. Joseph, uh, or, uh, Israel obviously shows, it says in here, that he shows favoritism toward, George, uh, toward Joseph. He buys him clothes from Abercrombie where the other guys get their clothes from the Dollar General and from, you know, from, uh, from the Goodwill. And they, they, they see that. They see how he's treated. Also, Joseph is given a position that's higher ranking in the family business. The rest of the guys are shepherds. Joseph seems to be some kind of a boss of them, some kind of an overseer of them. And this produces more than just your average sibling rivalry. This produces hatred. His brothers absolutely hate Joseph. Read in verse, thir- uh, verse 4 of chapter 37. But when his brothers saw that their father loved Joseph, him, more than all the other brothers, they hated him and could not even speak peaceably to him. And to make matters worse, Joseph loves to kind of brag about it. He, he likes to show off that he's the favorite of his sons. And Joseph is a dreamer. He has these dreams. And And he loves to tell his brother about his dreams. Now, I grew up the youngest of five children. I was the baby of the family. And my sisters um, uh, would have some really crazy dreams. One sister in particular, she was just, I mean, really, really some odd stuff. And she would tell us about them sometimes um, over the breakfast table. And one more, I remember this dream, so I got to tell you about it. I was thinking of it when I was studying this. One uh, morning she woke up and she said, guys, let me tell you about my dream last night. Barry Gibb of the Bee Gees came to our house. I'm going to tell my age here, too, and my sister's age. With E.T. and Michael Jackson. We all hopped on a bicycle, my sister. All hop, they all hopped on a bicycle and went to the moon. While they were on the moon, they were walking backwards. Get it? Walking backwards while singing the song, Stay Alive. They had to do this to keep the aliens from attacking them with a new disease called night fever. The dream ended when Barry, E.T., Michael, and my, I'm not kidding, this happened. Um, uh, E.T., Michael, and my sister, and Barry Gibb all sang Beat It while throwing Reese Pieces like this <laughs> at the aliens. It was a thriller, let me tell you. You get it? Uh, I don't know. Oh, but look, my sister's dreams were nuts. They were weird. They were crazy, but they didn't make statements other than my sister was weird and crazy, and her dreams showed that. Joseph's dreams made a statement about him and also about his brothers. See, Joseph had a dream, and in his dream, his brothers were bowing down before him, and his father and his mother were bowing down before him. Joseph's dreams made a statement that went against the social structure of the day. See, the social structure of the day was there's a hierarchical system, and the older brothers are always the higher on the totem pole. They're always the best. They're going to get the inheritance. The little brothers are the ones who are supposed to be bowing down to them. So when little bro Joseph comes in, little Joe, and he VeggieTales fans, how many of us want to go, little Joe? Oh, little, okay. Anyway, <laughs> when Joseph comes in bragging about these dreams, You know, he's saying, look, everything's going to be flipped on its head. You guys are going to be bowing down to me. You guys are going to be, um, um, you know, coming to me. I'm going to be over you. I don't know what reaction he was expecting out of this. Like the big brothers were going to go, well, okay, if that's the case, then since you had a dream and, you know, we're going to go ahead and start doing that tomorrow. We'll start bowing down tomorrow, but can we eat supper now? No, I don't know what kind of reaction he was expecting except for maybe just to stab a little bit at him. Um, But what happens is, is this produces Jealousy. You take hatred, you mix it with some jealousy, and you got a recipe for a forensic file. And that's what we're about to see. Okay, because here's what happens Jacob, 
Joseph's dad, sends him out to find his brothers. See, Joseph's got a little bit different role. He's not the shepherd. He's got the coat of many colors, which was a status symbol. His coat of long, it's actually in the Hebrew, it says the, the coat of long sleeves was a status symbol to show that Joseph doesn't do manual labor. Joseph does other types of labor, which looks like it's overseeing. So he goes out to find his brothers. And when he goes to see where they're supposed to be in this little valley called Shechem, they're not there. And Joseph's like, yeah, they're never where they're supposed to be. And then just happens along, there's a guy who walks along in the middle of this pasture, in the middle of nowhere. If you ever look at an Old Testament map, this is in the middle of nowhere. And he says, oh, yeah, this guy that's passing by says, I heard your brothers, I overheard them saying they were going to go take the sheep and go to another city down the road called Dothan. And so this is where we pick up the story again um, um, for, for Joseph here. In chapter, let me make sure I'm at the, yeah, chapter 37. Verse 18 through 20. They saw him from afar. Now, hold on. I got to make a comment here. Why does everybody see things through? Why, everybody in the Old Testament is sitting around their fire. Because they always see people from afar. You get it? I am sorry. I had to throw that in there too. Anyways, when they saw Joseph from afar, and before he came near to them, <laughs> Some people are laughing because it's funny. Some people are laughing because I cannot believe he just said that. <laughs> they conspire. Now, here's what happens. They see Joseph coming from afar off because he's got that coat of many colors. Kind of gives him away. And they conspired against him to kill him. Here comes the dreamer, they said to one another. Come on, let's kill him, throw him into a cistern, which is a deep well. We can tell our father a wild animal has eaten him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. Now, I want to stop for just a second there. Look, if I'm the little brother, I experience some people picking on me. I experience, I mean, I, I expect them to see Joseph coming and say, let's pull a great prank on this dreamer. No, you know, I, I could expect them thinking, okay, how about some atomic wedgies? You know, I, I, when I was a kid, I got like my share of those. My brother even hung me on the door one time oh. on the night and would swing. Anyway, I could expect that. I could expect, hey, let's get him in here and let's punch him in the arm until his arm hurts, you know, or something like that. No, they're playing, y'all, is to let's throw our little brother in a whale, hope that he dies. And if he doesn't die from it, um, you know, we'll figure out something else. But this is awful, and that's exactly what they do. When Joseph comes down there, they throw him into a, this whale and, and, and leave him for dead. In, in the Hebrew language here, when it says they throw him in the cistern, in the Hebrew language, it's the same word that they use when they're talking about putting a dead body into a grave or putting a dead body into a tomb. They thought he was dead. They apparently beat the daylights out of him, chunked him down in this whale, and they don't hope that he broke his arm. They hope he broke his neck. And they chuck him in there, and they're just waiting. And get this. Look at what happens. Look in Genesis uh, 37, 25. They throw him into the whale. He's moaning and groaning as they sat down to eat their meal. They sit down and have lunch. This is some really sick dudes. They sit down, seriously, they, they sit down and have lunch while their brother's over there moaning and moaning, about to die. I thought about this when I was studying this. I am so glad their last name wasn't Lecter or Dahmer. <laughs> Because they could have got two birds with one stone. Okay, anyways, uh, that went over well too. But wow, wow, what kind of guys these are. They leave him for dead. They don't say, let's make a little trouble for him. They say, let's kill him. Let's get rid of him. This is, this is, this is awful. And look at this, Genesis 37, 26. It gets even worse. Judah said to his brothers, this is one of the brothers, one of the other guys, what will we gain by killing our brother? We'd have to cover up the crime instead of hurting him. Let's sell him to those Ishmaelite traders that came by. After all, he is our brother, our only, or our flesh and blood. And his brothers agreed. So they, or when the Ishmaelite traders come, who the Midianite traders came by, Joseph's brother pulled him out of the cistern. That's the only work they did all day was pull him out of the cistern and throw him in there. Okay. And sold him for 20 pieces of Silver, they sell him for 20 pieces. Parents, stop, let me just pause here. Parents, stop and just look over at your families and say, you know what? We're not as bad as we thought we were. <laughs> I walked into my son's room this week after I was studying this. I walked in and I said, you know what? You're not as mean to your sisters, I've been telling you. Uh, you're not, at least you're not throwing her into whales and hoping that she's dead. But we, we have some hope here in this story that these guys. They're, they're, they're awful, they're sinister, but God's doing something in the background. We know that Joseph had a painful, painful experience in this entire process. 
I've often wondered, often wondered what Joseph thought of when he was either in the well or when they were selling him off and he was walking away. I wondered if he said to himself, what I do wrong? What I do wrong? I wonder if he said to himself, why me? I don't deserve, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve, I wonder if he said, I wish I would have just kept my mouth shut about that dream. Why didn't I just keep my mouth shut? How could, how could God be letting this happen to me? Any of you guys do this? When bad things happen to you in your life and you start saying, why? Why me? I don't deserve this. I wish I would have. Or we start blaming God for it and we start saying, hey, you know, God, what, what's, what's up? Where were you? We pray, God, do something. God, do something in this situation. Help me. God, you must not love me. God must not love me. Or God must be punishing me. He's punishing me for this because these awful things are happening. He must not love me anymore. He must be punishing me something. What is it? We start to wonder all these things. And I wonder if Joseph wondered those things as well. We know from chapter 42 that Joseph pled for his life. Joseph begged for his life. This was a soul-wrenching experience for Joseph. We know that from 42, as his brothers reminisce, they say this, we saw how distressed he was, our brother, when he pleaded with us for his life, but we would not listen to him. And I want to pause here and tell you something. If we, if we were in control of this situation, this story would end now. If we somehow had the power to intervene, if we somehow could send in an angel to stop this, we would. We would send in Roma Downey, in her white dress with her Northern Ireland accent. I've tried my Northern Ireland accent all week and I'm really bad, so I'm not going to use it. But from Touched by an Angel, for you young people, you know, it's Touched by an Angel. We would send in Roma down and she would go, now boys, you guys are brothers. You love each other. Stop doing this. And somehow we would work it out and we would hug it out and everybody would sing Kumbaya and Hallelujah and the story would end. But I am so glad that we are not writing this story. We would spare Joseph his pain. We would spare Joseph his suffering. But I am so glad. And the hundreds of thousands of people surrounding Egypt and his family are so glad that God is writing this story. I am so glad that we are not God. I am so glad that we are not sovereign. That we are not in control of this. Because we are in the hands of a good God who controls all things down to the minute detail. In chapter 37 of this story, guys, and before we move on, in chapter 37 of this story, I found this fascinating as I read this this week and studied it. In chapter 37, with all of this stuff is going on in the Joseph, with all this bad is happening, God is not mentioned one time. In all of the book of Genesis, in all 50 chapters, only, all 50 chapters, only three chapters are, have, are, have no mention of God in it. In 37, there is zero mention of God. God never speaks. He never does anything. He's never even referred to. Though God seems to be completely absent on the surface of this, God is arranging everything down to its smallest detail. And we'll see that as we keep going on. That he had a plan for Joseph and his brothers. And he had a plan to glorify his name. Chapter 37 of Genesis, verse 18 through 20 says this. When they saw, I'm sorry, chapter 39 opens with this. And I love this part of the story. Chapter 39 opens and says this. When Joseph was taken to Egypt by the Ishmaelite traders, he was purchased by Potiphar, an Egyptian officer. Potiphar was a captain of the guard for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And listen to this verse. The Lord was with Joseph. From chapter 37 to God being completely absent in the story, it seems. Chapter 38 is about another subject. Chapter 39, the story picks back up. And four times in chapter 39 we hear, and the Lord was with Joseph, and the Lord was with Joseph, and the Lord was with Joseph. And I want us to get this, guys. I want us to understand this. I want you to believe in this and wrap your life around it, that God is sovereign and God is in control. And even when you don't see him or even when you don't acknowledge him, God is working out stuff that you don't know and you can't see in your life. Joseph hears the Lord was with him four times in 39 now, for those of you who don't know the rest of the story, I'm going to tell it to you really, really quick. What happens in Joseph's life after this? After he's sold off into slavery by his brothers in this horrific act, you would think things would get better since the Lord was with him, but they don't. Joseph, after he leaves this entourage, goes to work in Potiphar, this captain of the guards' home, Potiphar's cougar wife. 
comes in one day and was like, and I love this in chapter 39 of this uh, text in Genesis. It says that Joseph was good looking and well built. Now, I don't know about you guys, but if I ever have a Bible verse written about me, wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be nice? And well, anyways, good thing the Bible's already written, so we don't have to add to it. But anyway, um, his wife, uh, uh, Potiphar's wife, she comes up and she actually says, I want you to have sex with me. In the Hebrew, it says, sex now, sex now, sex now. Okay, and Joseph refuses, gets him thrown in prison. Joseph gets thrown in prison. While he's in prison, he has two cellmates. These two cellmates have dreams that Joseph's able to interpret. One of them's a really good report or good interpretation. The other one's a really bad one. One guy gets, one of his cellmates gets out of prison. When he gets out of prison, he tells Joseph, he says, man, I'm going to remember that you could do this. I'm going to tell Pharaoh, I am actually the baker in the court of Pharaoh, the president of Egypt. I'm going to be going into his White House. And when I get there, I'm going to tell him about you. I'm going to tell him that you can do this. And when the guy gets out, he forgets. He forgets, guys, for two years. He forgets about Joseph. And then one day, Pharaoh, the president, king of Egypt, has a dream. And he says, man, I wish somebody could interpret my dream. And the baker goes, wait a minute, I remember a guy. Like, oh, goodness, I forgot. The guy over in cell block C, he could see. You like that? And he told me, interpreted a dream for me. And then he says, we'll bring him up here. And then Pharaoh has Joseph brought up. Joseph interprets his dream. And immediately Joseph is placed as vice president of Egypt. The guy who was in a pit is now the vice president of Egypt. It's a pretty big deal back then. Joseph's put in charge of everything over Egypt. And through Joseph's position there, he is able to save the lives of hundreds of thousands of people around the, or the, the surrounding nations around Egypt and also his brothers, which is where we come to in chapter 50. Joseph is able to look at his brothers and tell them, don't be afraid. I'm not going to kill you. Am I in the place of God? As for you, what you intended against me for evil, God intended for good in order to accomplish a day like this, to preserve, listen, to preserve the lives of many. Yours, your little ones, Joseph goes on to say, your little ones are going to be saved now, and all these nations surrounding it. God was in it. Joseph learned something that we all must learn in our lives. Number one, that God is good. God's good. Number two, that God is completely and utterly in control of everything. See, man may be responsible in human history, but God is sovereign over human history. We learn a valuable lesson in the story of Joseph. Let his testimony ring true to you, that God's good and that God's in control, whatever it is. I want you to hear this too. As we look back at chapter 37, I want you to hear this because this is, this, is this is a major point for us to understand is that, guys, God is working just as much. Hear this. God is working just as much in your life in his apparent absence as he is in his obvious presence. Hear that. God is at work in your lives in his apparent absences as he is in his times of obvious presence. God is at work doing something always in our lives. Joseph saved the lives of hundreds of thousands of people because he was made to be the vice president of Egypt. He became the vice president of Egypt because he interpreted a dream for Pharaoh the king. He interpreted a dream for Pharaoh the king because his baker, that cellmate, forgot him for two years. Listen, it all happened in sequence and exactly how God had it planned. What if the baker remembers Joseph a month after? What if? Then Pharaoh doesn't have Joseph to interpret his dream two years later. It's got to happen when God wanted it to happen and how God wanted it to happen. Joseph was able to interpret this dream because he was in prison with this baker because of Potiphar's wife. He was in prison because of Potiphar's wife because 
On the way to check on his brothers in Dothan, some random guy, some random guy says, hey, I know where they went. I know where your brothers are. You can go find them. Joseph was out trying to find his brothers because Jacob, his father, wanted him to go out and check up on him. Why did Jacob want him to do that? Because Jacob knew that God had a plan. God has everything worked out in our lives, guys, down to the last little detail. And we can't possibly think that we can be God long enough to see those orchestrated. The billions of different things that had to happen in your lives to get you to where you're sitting today. Let me tell you about that. How'd you get here today? Why are you sitting in Hope Community Church? Let me tell you something. 17 years ago, 17 years ago, I was ordained by, in a little church up in Lawndale by a man named Ron L. Owensby, one of the most wonderful, most impactful men on my life that I've ever known. He ordained me into the ministry. Shortly after he ordained me, he resigned from that church. He was the interim there. He resigned. And he began to do interim work all over the place. And for the, listen to this. For the next 10 years, he would always call me and say, Jeremy, the people over at Bear Walla Baptist could sure use a resume. And I would say, they ain't getting one for me. I told him no for 10 years. This is no, every year nearly, he would call me and say, can you send me a resume? Can you send me a resume? I told him no. I told him no for 10 years. Six years ago, I quit my job as a high school teacher and went to work at a church with a friend of mine who was starting a church, or his church had just grown, and he asked me to come, and I went over and helped him with this church. Um, we were close friends, and for two years, we, we worked together inside this church. Two years after that, I was called in on Thursday by him and eight other of my friends, and they said, we have written your resignation sign it. You're fired. I had my Joseph moment thrown into a pit by people I absolutely adored. Never remember, or I'll never forget riding away from that church that day, that parking lot. My wife worked there, still works there. Riding home and thinking, what am I going to tell my wife? She was nine months pregnant. What am I going to tell her? This is awful. Devastated me, devastated me, crushed me. Didn't know how to respond, didn't know how to react. And on the way home that day, as audible as God can whisper, he whispered in my ear and said, you're Joseph. That's all he told me. That's all I heard. You're Joseph, son. I went home and opened my Bible and I start studying this story of Joseph. And I'm like, what's that mean? There's some good stuff or some bad stuff. You know? <laughs> what's that going to look like? But he says, you're Joseph. Three months after, three months after that, three months after that, I get a call from Ron L who just happened to be doing interim work here at Second Baptist Church and said, Jeremy, the folks at Second Baptist could sure use a resume. And for the first time in 10 years, and I don't know why, except now I do, I said, you know what, Ron L? I think I'll send you a resume. And he said, you know what? I think I'll get sick next week. And he did. And I came and preached a sermon here. Before I left the parking lot that day, God grabbed me on, right out there underneath that little pass. Before I left the parking lot, he said, this is where I want you. About a month later, I get a call from a young man named Howard Harrell. He's one of our elders here. He was a Second Baptist deacon at the time, and he said, Jeremy, listen to this. He said, we have looked at over 100 resumes over the past three to six years, over 100 resumes. We have listened to 90 different sermons from pastors that are wanting to be here, and we have, we have said no to all of them. But we believe that God has called you here. I said, yeah, you know what? I think the same thing. But I told him this. I said, here's the thing. It's different. Something's different. I said, God wants to do something here that I've never felt him say before. He's given a dream, if I can say it that way, but God is gonna do something here. You guys prepare yourselves for it. Three years ago, while driving to Shelby, I picked up the phone. I'd never met Skip Allen in my life. Didn't know him from Adam's house cap. I said, hey, Skip, this is Pastor Jeremy Peeler from Second Baptist Church. I said, I believe that here's what God wants us to do. I, by the way, I had been off on a retreat in the middle of a creek praying 
At the same time, Skip was in Ridgecrest by himself on a retreat praying. We didn't know each other. And I said, hey, here's what I think God wants us to do. I think God wants to take your church and take our church and merge them together and do some kind of crazy thing there to reach this community. I don't know what. And here's exactly what he said. He said, sir, you're not gonna believe what I'm about to tell you. He said, for the past two years, I've been coming to your parking lot when nobody was there and praying. He said, when you called me, just when you called me, he said, my entire staff, we were in our offices on our face praying that the pastor of Second Baptist would call us. They didn't know me. So why are you sitting in here today? It's because God had every minute detail worked out. Everyone, all of them. God is a good God who is sovereign over all things. Over all things. The greatest example that we see in Scripture of God being in control is on a cross at Calvary. Oh, it looks like it's out of control. It looks like there is the absence of God and He's doing nothing. As Jesus cries out, why have you forsaken me? It looks like it is over. It looks like God is absent, but guess what? Three days later, there's an empty tomb to show to everybody all throughout the world that God is in control of all things. One of these days, guys, we're going to be in heaven together, I pray, through the fullest preaching of this story of Joseph today, the fullest testimony of an old preacher boy like me, the testimony of the cross of Christ, that you'll believe in it, and we'll be there one day standing there, and we're going to look at each other and go, wow, he had all this planned. Isn't he good? And isn't he sovereign? I want to throw up one last thing. The Lord was with Joseph. When I was in a high school, I taught high school for 14 years. And my first assignment, I taught history. My first assignment was I'd tell them, take your paper and fold it like a hot dog. Open it back up and they'd have the line in the middle. And I would say, that's a timeline. And what I want you to do today is do a little history, but on yourself. Give me your events around your birth. Maybe not even when you were born. Maybe there's some story around it. Give me that. Give me a turning point in your life where things started to change. As a teacher over the years, I saw some things that would just make you cry. And I would always say, there's, there's, there's turning points. I said, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to put today, and I want you to predict what might happen. Here's what I want you to do today you to fill your name in that blank. That awful thing that happened to you, put your name there and say, the Lord was with Jeremy. Put your name there. The Lord is with Jeremy. God is with you now. Some of you in your hearts, they're burning so much right now. They're beating so fast and that is God preaching crying out to you to accept his son to acknowledge that this sovereign God is with you and then on the last thing predict this the Lord will always be with you he'll always be with you put your name in the blame let's pray God I thank you that you have made a way I look back there on that wall and I see that cross on that stained glass and I praise you that you made that way for us I praise you God that you were sovereign over my life when I think of little cotton top kid in that pew in Lincolnton when you spoke to me in all the in-betweens of my life God I just want to cry out you are good you are in control and I'm so glad you are I pray God for the people in here that have been trying to control their lives 
and they're really tired of trying to be you, I pray that they would just rest. They would just rest and say, God, you've got this. May your name be made great today. May we trust you tomorrow as much as today. May we realize that you were doing just as much work when we didn't think you were there as you're doing right now. We love you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for all. That means something different to all of us, but thank you for all that you have done in our lives. We praise you for what you're going to do. In the name of Jesus.